This is Linux Unplugged, episode 39, for May 6, 2014. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's still not exactly sure what the Internet of Things even is. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Episode 39, buddy. 40 is just around the corner. Are you feeling it? I am feeling it. Yeah, no now, you, it, it feels like we're, I don't want to break too much because this week, Coda Radio just hit episode 100, which is wow. pretty exciting. Uh, so congrats to my co-host over there, Mr. Dominic, for 100 weeks in a row, too, which is, which is pretty incredible. awesome. Now, uh, Matt... You know, coming up on this week's show, I, there's been a couple of things that have been sort of gnawing away at the back of me. I, you know, we, we look at the Linux landscape in the context of where things are going to be in a few years, and there's a lot of, lot of change. You've got uh, the number one Linux desktop, Ubuntu, is going to make huge changes over the next few years, roll out new applications based on Qt. You've got Wayland that's going to be in the market at the same time that Mir and X11 are going to be in the market. That's going to be a, a sort of fragmentation. But then also you've got this other end of it, this Internet of Things, it's going to be a bunch of little devices from light bulbs that run Linux, don't laugh, that's actually a thing, uh, wow. to, you know, like devices in your kitchen that control your toaster, all running Linux, all different iterations of Linux, but none of them quite compatible with each other. So there's a lot of types of fragmentation that are coming up, so I want to talk about some of those this week, identify some of the ones that are concerning us, and then what I'd love to kick around with the mumble room is like, hey, well, what would we like to see? the outcome be? Yeah. What would we like to do? Like if we if we could just wave a magic wand and the future turned out in a certain way so that way applications could be written for Linux desktop and it wouldn't matter what distribution you're on. Things like client-side decoration could just be magically cleared up. The QT GTK war automatically sorts itself out. Like if we could just pick from these things, what would we pick and where would that leave us? I want to talk about that in today's show. We'll do that in just a little bit. But Matt, there's something I like to follow up on from time to time. Oh boy. Yeah, that's a Valve update, Matt. We got to do a little Valve update because I think this is the work that Valve is doing is one of those interesting story in, stories in the Linux landscape where you have a vendor who's working on a lot of open source infrastructure. The end result is it makes their commercial platform more successful. It makes they sell more closed source software, some of which or most of which is even wrapped in DRM. But to accomplish that ends, the means is improving open source. And I think this is a really interesting dynamic for us to watch. So our Valve update this week is a story that ran on Pharonix yesterday. Uh, improvements to Mesa, or Mesa, done by Lenar G and sponsored by Valve, are now an open source patch set. Get ready for this. It's a total of 21 patches that these changes reduce the startup time of applications that can handle deferred compilation of GSL shaders. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting, that's good. In practice, after these patches are applied, a game like Dota 2 is running with a 20-second reduction in loading times across the board for oh, Intel wow. Power Gigabyte Bricks Pro systems. Uh, Valve's already merging those patches into the SteamOS Mesa branch and will be shipping as part of their next driver release cycle for SteamOS, which will be open source. Uh, so I, um, you know, we've this is the third or fourth story now we've done where there's some boring piece of underlying code that was apparently just ripe for the optimization, and now we all benefit from that. And I think this, uh, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be a lot of commercial companies that are building on the backs of open source. But when it's done right, and I don't want to sit here and just be Mr. Valve fanboy, but when it's done right, like Valve is doing right here, everybody benefits. Well, and it seems like they really nailed it because, I mean, like, you know, at first pass, someone hears this and they think, eh, whoop de doo they're doing something, whoop de you know, the Valve does stuff kind of thing, right? Yeah. And then you actually see the benefit of it and you're like, you kind of do a double take and think, oh, hey, whoa, now I care. 20 I mean, second reduction actually, in load time is, yeah. is like something that I can actually grok. I understand what exactly. that means and I, I want that on my games. Definitely. Pretty cool. Definitely. It's all early days, but it's, it's just... I don't know. I, right I really, direction. I really like uh, what we're seeing. Come, I really like the way Valve is going about this, and I just kind of want to highlight it because I want to encourage it. Um, before we get to our first email, we got uh, we got a Magia question that came in, uh, and uh, he's going to put us to task, Matt. He's going to stick it to us, and rightfully so. I will add. 
Uh, Magia has been uh, missing from the discussion a lot, so Aaron's going to talk to us about that. But first, I want to thank our first sponsor this week, and that is Ting. What is Ting? Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider. And this is why I'm going to tell you about him right here, right now, because you've got to know about Ting. Here's the best part. No contracts, no early termination fees. You only pay for what you use. You only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 a month, and then it's your individual usage on top of that. Ting takes your messages, your megabytes, your minutes. They add them all up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. It included hotspot tethering. Also included, no hold customer support. It, this is some, And they have some serious devices. But what is also great about Ting is they do some fun initiatives. They've just launched their Drop Your Data Challenge. This is one of those things that I think is brilliant nice. because not only is it a, it's as a nerd, like I'm, I'm ready to take on the challenge of figuring out like how to game the system and get my data usage down. Like I'm all, I'm all about that anyway. Save me some money. This is one of those challenges that you save money while you're doing it. But they're also opening this up to non-Ting customers. You don't have to be a Ting customer to participate. In fact, non-Ting customers can take the data savings challenge and be entered a random drawing to win $1,000 cash or one of 300 and, uh, or three people will get $150 of Ting credits. Now, of course, Ting customers, you can save even more while you're doing this by bringing your data usage down. And if you're not yet a Ting customer, in addition to being entered to win a random prize, they'll give you a Ting credit for the percentage of your data savings from week to week to help you make the move even better. So, in other words, if you cut your data usage by 74%, then Ting will give you a $74 Ting credit. So they're already starting up. You can go get it right now. They've they got an app you can use to track this for you, or they'll take the native stat tracking in the Android or iOS uh, system settings. Pretty nice. They've got a couple apps they'll recommend. And they've even got a Google calendar where you can add to your calendar for the, for the length of the Drop Your Data Challenge. If you already want to, if you want to do this anyways, because why not? You drop your data usage. You're going to save money. You're saving battery. You're lowering your bill. And you have an opportunity to win. So go over to linux.ting.com. That's where you can find out more, and that's where you can get started, linux.ting.com. Also, if you want to make the switch, linux.ting.com will take $25 off your first device. If you've already got a device, like the HTC One, or maybe you've got an iPhone 4, 4S, or 5, maybe you've got an S3, an S4 you want to bring over, well, then that linux.ting.com URL will just take $25 off your first month of Ting, or actually however long the $25 lasts. Since it's only $6 a month, it might last you a little while. Linux.ting.com. And a really big thank you to Ting. And go try out their Drop Your Data Challenge. You can find out more ting.com slash blog. Go to linux.ting.com. First, that lets them know you appreciate them supporting the show. Okay, Matt. Stuff. Let's get honest. Let's fess up. Let's read okay. Aaron's email about Magia. <laughs> okay. He says, hi, I'm a follower of Last and Unplugged. I'd like to see some discussion of Magia. It seems to be a popular distro that follows free software principles a la Debian. Currently, I'm running Fedora 20 and wondering how or if these distros compare. Thanks for and keep up the great work. So I, I'm going to be honest right now. For some reason, I have not been particularly interested in checking out the more recent Magia builds. Have you, th have you like, downloaded an ISO and thrown it on a rig at all, Matt? Honestly, never had a, a real probability, you know, a real reason to. Yeah. I mean, you know, Other it's, it's just, great. I'm sure it's I fine. I have a but, passing yeah. curiosity, but yeah. I don't. So, Mumble Room, I'll open it up to you. Anybody in here want to take the Magia defense position or maybe why they're not interested in Magia? Because I'll tell you where I'm sitting at, Mumble Room, is I'm kind of like, okay, I love that they're still going. That's great. More power to them. Yeah. But I feel like my needs between all the other distros are pretty much already solved. What is Magia offering me that I don't already have anywhere else? I think it's, it's a good somewhere else to go if if you don't like what options you have on offer. There's there's a guy I met at a recent conference who said he, he left and he contributes to Magia because he wasn't accepted in whatever other community that that um, he was trying to contribute to. So Are you saying it's like it's a, a Linux good, refugee camp? I think so, yeah. But in a good way. Yeah, pretty much. Like, <laughs> wow. Magia yeah. is like... Open, like if you don't want to use OpenSUSE because it's like all the Microsoft backing and all that stuff, you just don't want to use Fedora and then there's Magia. So. Hmm. I mean, I, Magia, hmm. Magia has an awesome uh, software manager. It's just like by default they have some weird things that's going wrong with it. But uh, the software manager is cool because you can get uh, all all different repos and like there's uh, options of like 40 to 50 repos that you can uh, activate. But by default, they're all disabled, oh. which I find weird, huh. but... Um, Are they still using uh, URPMI? Do you know? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. okay. 
So it's pretty cool that you can do that, and you can get you can like uh, easily go from beta packages to stable packages and stuff like that just by getting a checkbox. But it's annoying to set up in the first place. But once you get it set up, it's very nice. Yeah, I, I do like that. I, I also, mean, also, Magia has the closest thing to Yast that you can get outside of OpenSUSE. Right, right. Mm. The Drac is it still called Drac config? Oh, yeah, the old like Mandrake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old. Yeah. Uh, Here's a good question. Does uh, Man- uh, Magia have something similar to the OBS or the AUR? Not really. No. No. The, the repos are kind of limited, too, is the only thing. They're, they have, they're, they're technically, in, in, a, in a way, they have like an, a, an AUR with because all the beta repositories that they support, but it's not like an official one place you can go to to get everything and have like any kind of rating system. And to be, to be, Honest, I I kind of am really annoyed by Magia's packaging structure because if you don't have Magia installed, you can't really tell what versions they have of anything because their packages is all listed out on mirrors. So you have to find a mirror that has the files. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Forget that. (laughs) Yeah, from a developer standpoint, that's a nightmare. Yeah. From a user standpoint, that's a nightmare. I want to know what I'm using, you know, or what well, I'm going to be using, rather. Well, once you have it installed, it's 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 fine. You can oh, yeah. easily just open up the open the the software manager or yeah. whatever they call it. I forgot, but it's it's nice. But you have to install it first. Yeah. So I'm looking to see what dependency they have by default. I have right. to load up Magia before I can find out. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. okay. Well, good info. And I think you know it's something that Matt and I will just the, just it's our nature to keep an eye on these kinds of things. So we'll watch sure. it. And when there's something there that sort of tickles our fancy, uh, we might jump in and do a review at some point. I don't I don't think we have any immediate plans, but it's not a, it's not something we would never do. It's something we would consider when there's when there's a moment and it seems like the right time. Uh, Corky writes in. He, you know, he had an idea for a recap episode. I'm not so sure about that, but he said I came across your episode from April 14th, 2013, about Linux's use as a media creator. You criticized mm-hmm. Linux's lack of tools for use for you, and it meant you needed to edit on a Hackintosh. Well, a year has gone by, and a lot has changed since then. Mm-hmm. Perhaps a recap episode would be a good idea. You mentioned tools such as Telestream. I know quite a lot's changed, so an update. Um. You know, I, I can give them one right now. Okay. It still sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, I mean, yeah, and, I, and I do edit stuff on Linux now. Yeah, so. there's there's tools, right? Um, there's mm-hmm. tools. Um, uh, and here's how here's here's my new philosophy that I'm coming at to at this. I got a new angle for solving this problem, Matt. Okay. Uh, uh, is one is a oh, Rekai works with works with us now, and he's he's now taken over the editing. So that's taken yeah. off. That's taken that off my plate. So uh, that's really nice. And what I th- what I've been thinking about doing as, as time moves on is um, sort of building up a, a kind of a mobile setup, and and mm. that would entail in itself if I'm out on the road and things like that, its own separate workflow, anyways. And it seems like the time to switch over. At, uh, uh, you know, I talked a lot with Noah from who joined us for Linux Fest about this. Maybe the time to switch over to Lightworks, ex- for example, for editing is the time when I'm already setting up a new workflow. Anyways, and now that I'm not handling the day-to-day show um, post-production, I can kind of zoom out a little bit and look at all of my options, and I, I, I can now afford to sort of kill time uh, trying out different stuff and don't have to worry about interrupting the flow of every single show. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to kind of build a new workflow, and then maybe one day that workflow will become competent and inclusive enough that it could replace the old workflow as sort of a wholesale upgrade at some point when all the pieces are there. Now, on the back end, some of the changes that have already happened with the new studio move is Rekai has re- re- written this great script that um, automates a lot of the encoding and tagging process that I, I have done that at different points, but had sort of just abandoned my automation and was doing it all manually by hand. And the great thing about that system is it's taking that encoding process, and that's completely portable. That can run on a Mac if you install Brew, or that could run really straightforwardly on a Linux box. And so we can move it around depending on where horsepower is at. So some of the tools we're using now are open source just based on the new workflow that we have. The editing is still Final Cut. Um, and I, you know, the problem is it's, it's just a good product. Uh, you, despite what the internet will tell you, it actually... 
is a good product, especially for online media production. So what I'm curious to see is, can Lightworks be comparable? Uh, and I won't know that until you know I've used it for a while and I've set up a new sure. workflow. But that's my new goal, is to kind of go down that path on a new setup. The Bonobo is certainly powerful enough to do mobile editing. You know, I have two drives in that, so I can read from one drive and write to another drive. Uh, I've, I've been experimenting with it on the Ultra Pro also, completely usable. And you can even get two drives in the Ultra Pro. Um, so there's a, uh, you know, Noah was when Noah was up here, he had a, he had it loaded on his Pixel. He had a he had yes. a Chromebook Pixel running Ubuntu that he had Lightworks on there, and he says it's usable. So I'm excited to give that a go. Uh, we're already, in, you know, there's other things we use too, like the YouTube download script for certain clips. Uh, nice. Oka or OSHA Audio is an open source ed audio editor. Um, Audacity, those are already in our tool chain as well. So some components, more components since that episode in April 14th of 2013, definitely more components are open source all, everywhere it makes sense. Uh, but the editing, at least probably for the rest of this year and into next year, I don't think will change unless I really come across something pretty fantastic in the new setup. And, we'll just and that would be nice to see. I mean, for myself personally, I've all but given up on OpenShot. Um, Kden Live is what's <laughs> kept me sane, uh, just because it won't crash on me. You know, I, I love the fact that regardless of the environment I'm in, I can depend on it. It yeah. gives me the functionality I want, and it it's not gonna it's not gonna take enough on me. So that's awesome. Um, audio Audacity. You know, so I mean, I do use the tools, and I and I actually was fighting with Audacity earlier this morning. So it's certainly not without its issues. Mm -hmm. But um, I do live in that world. I actually eat my own dog food on that, and mm -hmm. I do think it has a, it has a ways to go. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it's not just one particular program. I think that's no, what I want to underscore, no. right? It's not, you don't, it doesn't just take having an editor, right? Because then, okay, no. then once you have a good editor, well, what is your codec situation? And once you have exactly. that solved, okay, now what's your motion graphics suite? Because Blender is great, sure. but if you just want to be able to grab a motion template and edit it, well, you're out of luck. If you want to grab an After Effects template and edit it, you're out of luck. So right. we don't have to have a Blender. You're married to Blender templates at that point. Right. They, they are limited in comparison because, believe yeah. me, I've looked. Yes. You know, they really are. Thank, yeah, that's it. That's the problem. It's not insurmountable, but it also it, it also means it's not just about perfecting and replacing one single application, right. but an entire suite of applications. And that is more challenging, but you know what? Things change. Things change in big ways, and I would not say it will never be possible. I, I think it, I think it is possible, and I think we're working towards it right now. And we're just, you know, it's sometimes you just come up with new ways of doing your work, too, and then the different tools make more sense. Uh, all right, Matt, our last email today comes in from Captain Kirk, and uh, he says, awesome. uh, Chris and Matt, last week you touched on Ubuntu <laughs> One closing and made some recommendations regarding replacing Ubuntu One. When I learned Ubuntu One was to close, I got a DigitalOcean droplet, and I put OwnCloud on it. Uh, it is working fine for me, but since OwnCloud was not among your recommendations to replace Ubuntu One, I've become concerned. Is there a reason I should not use OwnCloud? Is it flawed in some way that I don't know about? Best regards, Captain Kirk. Well, you know what? I will answer Kirk's question right then and there. But first, this is just a great opportunity to thank our sponsor this week, and that is DigitalOcean. Here's what I want you to do right now. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. Use our brand new promo code, UN. Unplugged May. Unplugged May will get you a $10 credit. Now, what is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. And that is a huge deal. That really changes the game. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds, and pricing plans start about $5 per month, which will get you... Not about. It is five dollars per month. Well, we'll, that'll get you five hundred twelve megabytes of RAM, a twenty gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. A terabyte of transfer, you guys. We had somebody write in. He said, "Hey, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really use like half my bandwidth on DigitalOcean. So when Ubuntu fourteen oh four came out, I just spun up uh, a seed and I used a web transmission." to uh, help seed for a little while because I had about 500 gigs left on my cap. And that's a really nice. cool way to just like, hey, I got a machine. I can help out, you know, the Linux community a little bit. And, and the, trans the web transmission uh, client makes that super easy. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is so simple. The control panel is very intuitive. And power users can replicate that control panel on a larger scale with their straightforward API. It's really about the dashboard, too. The, the dashboard takes all of these different technologies, things that you really used to have to be an expert to take advantage of, things that I used to be able to charge lots of money for my clients to implement for them are now so straightforward 
that it, it's kind of amazing. They have this droplet system where you can create image backups, you can move them around, you can snapshot before you make any big changes, you can move them between data centers. They also now support private networking. There's lots of really great features, all built around this really simple and intuitive dashboard. It gives you an HTML5 console so you can look at the machine as it boots up right at the BIOS level all the way up through post. Two-factor authentication if you want to be secure. It's so great. And there's more and more cool community applications that take advantage of their awesome API. So use our promo code Unplugged May when you check out. That's going to get you the $10 credit so you can try the $5 rig. I've been using the $5 rig for months and months now. When you combine the power of KVM sitting on top of these SSD drives with tier one bandwidth and data center locations all over the world, the combination is absolutely insane. And you can try it for free for two months with that $5 rig, Unplugged May. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. It's a great service. Good okay, stuff. so to answer yeah. his question about own cloud, um, I, you know, I, I haven't brought up own cloud as a sync solution simply because every time I've implemented own cloud, I, I have ran into some serious performance issues, and uh, I, I don't know if it's my setup. I, I, I don't, I don't want to presume that own cloud is inherently has some sort of problem. But I have, I have had significant performance issues, and I think it's because of the amount of files that I have deployed. And I have tried it on everything from a Raspberry Pi to a fairly high-end i5 home server, and I still have not been happy with the performance. That's not the case for everybody, and that's why it doesn't come front to my mind. But if it works for you, then have at it, man. That's awesome. OwnCloud's a great solution for you. Well, and to elaborate, so you're, when you're talking about performance, if I'm not mistaken, you're actually talking about the actual performance of like accessing a file or you know actually getting something yeah. to sync, not not merely bandwidth, but going right. deeper than that. Yeah, yeah, okay. like, like the UI and retrieving the directory listing and all those things for me has been uh, a little a little slow. Now, uh, Fader in the chat room is pointing out you can change the database backend, and perhaps it was just my database backend selection. Now, I've done it a couple of times. I do not remember which database backend I used each time. I, I believe I've varied it up with still limited success. Uh, I don't know, Mumble Room, anybody in here had similar experiences with OwnCloud or an opposite experience with OwnCloud that uh, you want to chime in with? Well, I just tried setting it up one time just on a server, just on a little server rig. And I don't know if I did something wrong or what it was, but it was just a pain in my but the whole time, it <laughs> never worked right. Uh, I got it set up easy enough, but I didn't have a use for it because I have ridiculously fast network at my house, and so I don't want to sync to the internet. Yeah. Well, Derek Devon, what uh, was your experience? Well, my experience was really weird. Um, I think, at least I got the impression that they're trying to make it like hard because they have like this duality of the community edition and their own edition for enterprise. So I think they're kind of trying to p get people to approach their services. I, I don't know. It, it just, like, even you do the installation, everything is correct, and you just trickled everything, and images start missing, things not loading. Um, that was my experience with it, and I've retried. And it appears that each version, installation gets difficult. Mm. I had image um, duplication. Um, yeah. Doesn't does SUSE Studio have a version of OnCloud that can use? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, and and it's not difficult to install in pretty much any distro. And you know, I'm seeing comments in the chat room right now. They're saying, "Hey, we're using it in production at my work. It's just fine." So I think it depends on maybe the database backend setting, how many files you have in there, you know, those kinds of things. Because to be honest, I was load mine up with a ton of pictures and music. And you know, if you maybe you're more document focused and more calendar focused and contact focused, it, it might just work just fine. And you know, maybe maybe if I didn't have to put ten thousand pictures in there and twenty thousand songs. <laughs> <laughs> that could be, there's your sign. Maybe it would work sign. a little better. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about a topic with you guys. Um, now, Poby, don't take offense. This is just food for thought. Um, but, and it actually doesn't, I'm going to say, let's look at this in the context of a, a post Ubuntu dominant desktop world, but it actually is just as applicable if Ubuntu is still the number one Linux distro. So it actually works either way. But something that's been sort of gnawing away at the back of my head, uh, for the whole year at least, is a very awkward future we're going into in the next couple of years. It's come up a couple of times on the show, but this week I want to kind of take a different take on it. Uh, we have a few things that are coming up soon, sooner than I think we'll all realize. They'll just be here. Uh, number one, let's stick on the Ubuntu thread. Um, 
Now, caveat, 1404 will be out for five years, LTS. Okay, we're all establishing that. Now, the newer releases of Ubuntu, based on Unity 8, are going to have, on the desktop side, brand new applications written in Qt that, just like always happens in the Linux community, some people will think are great and praise them for being innovative and the right direction. And some people will hate them, and they will... They will they'll declare that uh, you know Ubuntu has ruined the desktop and and then and, and they'll leave and it'll probably be pretty you know there'll there'll probably be a lot of people on both sides of that aisle and I I think the likely outcome of that would be people who are frustrated they're not just all going to jump to one distribution you know they're not all going to go in unison and say all right it's time to make uh, OpenSUSE our our new distro and all of a sudden OpenSUSE becomes the big fat lizard of the Linux community I, or they're not all going to go to Fedora or Mangia or Arch. Right, it's not going to be any of those. Exactly. Instead, you know, if anything, it's probably going to be a, a, a mass spreading out across all of the distributions, um, and it, it won't be it won't be like devastating for for Ubuntu. It'll just be it'll I would I would foresee more folks moving out that are unhappy with some of the changes, uh, but that that brings with it that that elephant in the room that that a lot of developers who are targeting the Linux desktop like to mention, and that is fragmentation. And not only will we have this sort of user base fragmentation over the next couple of years, but we will also have display server fragmentation. We'll have Wayland, we'll have Mir, and we'll also have distributions that just elect to stay on X11 for very legitimate reasons for a lot longer than we all expect. And, and so we will have fragmentation at that layer. And then at the same time, there is a really interesting de development battle brewing where GTK is starting to maybe not become the preferred targeted uh, framework for new desktop Linux applications. A lot of people are talking about Qt. It offers a lot of advantages. It's great with mobile platforms. Uh, it's a good technology in general. Uh, obviously, the canonical folks are switching over to it. So there's a fragmentation there. And then on top of that, you've got just a general desktop environment fragmentation where some desktop applications handle notifications in one way. Another desktop environment handles it in another way. Some draw borders, some don't draw borders, right? It's all over the map. <laughs> and this is just going to be in the next few years. And I'm trying to wrap my brain around this, and I'm thinking at the same time, at the hardware side of things, I, it sounds like calling it the cloud, but you've got this internet of things, right? All of these devices from from Philips light bulbs to the to the toaster to the TV to your to your um, you know your garage door opener to your front door locks. There's going to be devices out there running Linux talking to each other, but they're not going to be compatible Linux boxes. You know they're not going to be able to run the same applications. You're not going to be able to write once and run it anywhere. They're not going to have the same processors. It's another type of fragmentation. Not but not one I am particularly worried about. You know the Linux core itself. Linux core itself is it's pretty solid. You know you know that you're going to have glibc. You know you're probably going to have gstreamer or qt. You know you're probably going to have cups for printing. You know you're probably going to have webkit if you need to draw an html box. So those things are kind of standardized. The core, the kernel, systemd, all that kind of stuff is pretty standardized. So I'm not so worried there, but I am pretty worried about the desktop because I can't see where this is going where end users don't lose out and where developers where developers don't get so frustrated they just put their hands up and say screw it I'm going to write an application for the Mac because I know they'll spend money and I only have to write it for one operating system and let's be honest all this is happening when the dominant desktop Linux or the dominant uh, commercial desktop platforms are getting pretty boring you know they're not changing very much and a lot of developers like that. They like that particular brand of boring because it's easy for them to make money on. And that's definitely not a brand Linux has to offer. So I thought maybe we could discuss with the mumble room, with our virtual lug, how we'd like to see this play out. What would we, what if we could wave a magic wand and push the future of desktop Linux in a certain direction? to prevent some of these problems, to save ourselves this obvious hassle that we are all about to encounter. I mean, it's like we're all driving down this freeway going 80 miles per hour, and we know that there's a bunch of trouble up ahead, and the bridge is out, but we're still going. And we, you know, we just hope that when we get to the bridge, uh, we'll just jump that gap and nobody will notice. Ah, the bridge is out, nobody notices. But if we could like somehow build that bridge before we got there, what would we make that look like? And that's one of the things I thought maybe we could toss around today. I, I think it's a tempest in a teapot. Go ahead, Ick. Yeah, I think we got a tempest in a teapot. Um, I, so many people I talked to at Linux Fest Northwest about the direction Unity is going and how it's going to be mostly QT-based seemed really happy about that. Yeah. They, 
they, they seem like it'd be more solid. So that was my takeaway uh, easier, too. Yeah, easier program, t- easier to program on. That guy keeps seeing Qt programs on Windows too. So you know, it's it's cross platform. You can do, you can go anywhere with Qt. So it's it's easier for purposes of making cross cross platform applications. So, so, so you're saying in, in your Linux desktop of the future, Qt is sort of emerged as the dominant framework that applications are developed with. I think so because it's more cross cross platform. Therefore, more people can program with it, and it can be port easily easily portable. And I want to see more of that. All right, honestly, I'll, I'll go to Heaven's next, and then and then Popey's up. So go ahead, Heaven's. What were you gonna say? Well, I would like the next iteration of what I wanted Chrome OS to be. Right now, Google kind of screwed up what I imagined Chrome OS to actually be. Qt and GTK both have embedded JavaScript interpreters or ECMAScript interpreters, which actually make them do their beautiful magic. QML and GJC, the JavaScript inside of GTK, which makes it absolutely Mac-ish pretty. So I think because JavaScript was invented to control UI elements as its fundamental, that's what its design goal was, it's cross-platform. It can go to Mac, Linux, Windows, or run on your car. It doesn't have to be Windows or C++ or compiled in order to run on that platform. It's perfect for this Internet of Things future. Now, before we go to Popey, Tyler, you wanted to kind of dovetail on something that Ick was just saying. Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted to also say part of our discussion when we were at Linux Fest Northwest also involved talking about Mirror versus Wayland and the direction I'd like to see the video card companies go is develop the kernel driver as open source like AMD wants to move towards or Intel and uh, so that kind of reduces some of the compatibility issues that we would have with proprietary drivers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now yeah. Poby I want to I want to throw something in your face so let's say here when I'm saying you know the future desktop what I'm saying is like there's some sort of overall consensus in the development community that when we're writing a desktop application for Linux these are the things we target and it's sort of the whole hive mind in some magical future is sort of bought off on this Poby what would you like to see in that scenario so I, I'm going to take a step back and not answer that because I, I think your argument is flawed for two reasons. First is um, even if Unity is pure cute, that doesn't stop applications being GTK or some other sure, toolkit. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, whilst it's great that Unity is moving towards Qt, that's just one of the platforms Unity has been implemented on. There's It's been re-implemented multiple times and we've still been able to run Qt, GTK and other toolkit applications on top of that. We don't, we don't stop that happening. So, no, so, no, I wouldn't so say saying, so. So implying that in six months or a year or wherever the full Unity 8 mirror uh, lands on the desktop, implying that that means the world is cute and forget GTK or forget anything else. You can't run those things on Ubuntu, therefore it's gone. What's the post-apocalyptic world going to look like? <laughs> is is well, a somewhat, somewhat ooh, flawed argument. I think you're, I think you're think. a little sensitive because what I'm saying is uh, what, what the frustration is in the developers that I've heard from is that there's too many choices, right? And so what, we're, what I'm trying to come to is something that doesn't look fragmented, something that doesn't look out of place. I'm trying to come to some sort of consensus where we can have a desktop a, a desktop operating system that's filled with choice. Because one of the good things, honestly, is like uh, each distro solves a particular niche, and they're, they're good for right. those areas. So how do we come to something that is sort of each in each area looks like it belongs, look like it's in place. And what I'm what I'm suggesting is maybe if we could if we could sort of come to a consensus to to perhaps let's just say you know some sort of utopian future where uh, the, the cute transitions go so well that more and more people jump on board. Wouldn't that actually be a good thing? I don't think that's dystopia. I think that's good. Right. So I'm not saying there's a dystopia. My my reading was that the implication was, you know, that there's going to be this mass exodus from Ubuntu when when this happens. Maybe I I read that wrong. Oh, Maybe what I'm, I'm too s- oversensitive. Well, that's, yeah. No, what I'm I saying read. there is that there's going to be whenever you change applications like that, there's just going to be people who will make a big fuss, right? They make right. a big change. Change yeah. equals bad. Right. So, that, so, so that'll so, add a diverse. That'll add fragmentation. What I'm saying there is that's going to add fragmentation in the user base. What they're using. So I would say the best thing about this is you can take the 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 comments that Ike made and the comments that Heavens made, which is basically QML and Qt are great. Mm-hmm. JavaScript is great as well. We've implemented the 
our toolkit in QML, but we're also implementing it as HTML5. So if you want to bring your JavaScript app across, it will look the same on Ubuntu, whether it's a QML app or an HTML5 app. So you can get that same look and feel across yeah. different toolkits. I, that I, is I, possible. I, you know, that was sort of the pitch. To, well, in a sense, that was the pitch too that the Firefox OS guy made at Linux Fest, as you said. Uh, you know, the developer can make a make a phone app, and then you know they just redesign the layout, or maybe it automatically relays out and it's a web app too and you've you've written the application once and it runs in both spots and it saves the developer uh, having to duplicate work and if you could you know even with minor uh, minor tweaks to make it integrate properly take one application and move it across ubuntu touch ubuntu desktop firefox os and anybody who has a browser capable of rendering html5 that seems like a pretty compelling um, incentive for developers to target that even if one of the individual platforms doesn't have that much traction because in, in whole, there's a considerable amount of traction and a reduced amount of development time, which that's why I, that's why I really do think uh, Qt has a strong future, not just on the Linux desktop, but everywhere. And, and maybe it's Qt in a, in a combination of HTML5 apps. Are we worried about that, though? Is that a good thing? I mean, do we want a bunch of web apps? Um, now my response as far as Qt goes, I'm really hoping that if Ubuntu is heading towards Qt, popular applications like, let's say, Firefox or Chrome will start pulling their theming from Qt instead of GTK. Uh, yeah. But Chrome has stopped pulling from GTK anyways. They're doing their own thing. Aurora, right? Uh, do you guys have a lot of problem with the fragmentation? Like, I'm, I'm honestly sitting on a Windows computer running a GTK app and a Qt app side by side and... With my uh, Windows app, yeah. and I don't care. This is exactly where I wanted to go, because I think if you look at actual in production, uh, I don't know of a Linux desktop that at least is on x86 that doesn't have Chrome or Firefox, like Thunderbird, right? I mean, I'm just naming applications that are already cross-platform VLC. Um, we all have these, even though there's supposedly so much fragmentation already that developers could never target Linux. But yet, I've been using applications across uh, multiple different Linux desktops for years and years and years, and they're the same applications. I get them at the same time for the most part. I haven't had any problems. So let me ask you this. Is fragmentation just a bunch of crap? Is it, is it hype? Is it, is it just like something that developers use as an excuse to be lazy? I don't understand. Alan, yeah, I'd say as far as I'm my actually, response goes um, for wanting a beautiful desktop, GTK apps, and I'm a KDE user, do not fit into KDE that well at all unless you are limiting yourself to like a certain set of themes. But it works. It, it works, but it doesn't look good. Right. Yeah, that, and that bugs me. Well, well that, that doesn't bother me. And it doesn't I bother don't. most normals. I don't think it does either. Yeah, I think well, most users are muggles. The yeah. guy who write programs, it would probably be an easier idea if you have a layer to con connect all the toolkits and stuff so that they only use one set of interfaces. Well, but you know who does care actually are developers themselves. They they don't want to make... PC Wiz, close your mic. They don't want to make something that they think looks ugly, right? They're not going to put their time and effort into something well, that depends that, on which kind of developer you're talking about because you know yeah, some yeah. types are like i don't care what it looks like right, or, right. it has this really odd design because that's how i like it right and then you and, look at um i'd like to add on to it normals might care about it because you know you have this beautiful desktop and then you have this gtk app that might look like it came from windows 98 i mean i think normals might care when like for example the client side decoration thing where you've got two close bars two title bars i mean like well, yeah, they, that that's just confusing yeah wow you have a real bee in your bonnet about uh, client side decorations that's like the fourth episode of the show that you second episode but fourth mention uh yes second episode fourth <laughs> mention i agree i uh no it's because um it, it is the beginning of this of this particular type of this brand of fragmentation that I'm talking about and where it's happening right now. And uh, as a GNOME user, uh, you know what? I, I'm, I'm of a two minds of it. So I'm trying to wrap my brain around it because uh, I, I, I picture myself showing this to my mom who has been a graphic designer for, you know, almost all of her professional life. And that means she's used Mac since the since the 80s to, to right now. And I tried to put her down in front of an Ubuntu box because she wanted a new computer and I was showing her GIMP. And I, I could not even begin to describe to you how badly that went. And it's things like that that she just would look at and, and, and she would think, is this why it's free? That's literally what she'd say. Ouch. Ouch. Right now, for the client-side decorations, I think we're just in a phase. It is something that the desktop environments have to solve. It's not yeah. on the it's not the responsibility of other things right now. Mm -hmm. The client-side decorations is desktop-specific. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I wanted to just kind of close out my thoughts on the perfect desktop. Is w I would love to see more targeting of things that work across all desktops, not just Linux desktops, but all of them. And I'm willing to give this transition to more web apps a proper go because I feel like in the last couple of years, we've actually started to see web applications that are impressive. And I don't know if you guys have played around with it, but if you install Chrome and then there's the Chrome apps, it'll it, on on desk on I think all of the Linux desktops, it will add those Chrome apps as individual launcher icons, like in your menu or whatever activity screen, whatever you're looking at. And I, I launched the Plex one and it looks like I'm running it looks like I'm running a standalone Plex application and it's just a Chrome application. And it actually works. One thing out though. Go ahead. Um uh, Chrome the only thing about the only thing I don't like about the Chrome applications is that they use one in one session for all of them. So if you have mul you have multiples of the same web app you want, you you can't log in uh, separately. You have to log in just yeah. once, and then it makes a duplication. But if you look at Midori, they have an applications thing very similar to the way uh, Chrome does it. But they have them every single application being made has its own individual session. Uh, what if I have had the Firefox version of that? I you can they, do I that with profiles. With, uh, okay. No, but Prism. They had, they Prism. Had a, Prism. Prism was the application. Yeah, thing, bad yeah. name yeah. now. Dave, Dave, yeah. you were going to say maybe it's more about how the applications communicate with each other. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, think about how these how these different devices that we use uh, actually connect to each other. Right. I mean, I have uh, two phones, two laptops, and a desktop in my home, and they're they're all on the same Wi-Fi network. So I don't think at the end of the day it matters uh, what uh, graphical toolkit it's actually running or what the UI is. If they're all accessing the same file and writing to and from the same file, then they'll work together. For example, the Plex app. Uh, the Plex app is still reading from the same server, whether it's on your phone, whether it's on your laptop, or you know, right. on the on the cloud. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, I think we need a standardized uh, backend network interface for uh, phone applications and and desktop applications and uh, HTML uh, cloud applications to talk to each other. You know, we need a backend uh, connection, like say something like Unix sockets, but or, uh, you know, a standardized network interface where these things can talk to each other and they can work together with each other and just exchange data regardless of what the uh, individual UI is. Right, as long as you it know, can be I implemented think, uh, safely. Now, Daredevilin, you, like, were, you were going to make a point about how you just want to like get into a nice pair of comfy toolkit jeans and just walk around and feel good, right? <laughs> <laughs> did I make your point for you or did, did you want to add to that? No, yeah, I mean, if I'm familiar with the toolkit, um, I probably know how to leverage that toolkit to look just exactly how I want. Mm. And I'll do my application to look the best I can, and that's going to be my effort. Now, if a distribution later on that uses a different toolkit wants to pick it up, well, they better support my toolkit. And in the end, it will benefit every single user because there's more developers that just do like I do. They focus on what they know because... It's easier. I mean, if you're going to jump on toolkit to toolkit, sometimes you will gain um, an extra benefit. Like, for example, you go to elementary OS, you will have a very valid GTK-focused environment. You will get right. runtime uh, performance, uh, consistency with their teaming because they have these toolkits, uh, these uh, widgets that yeah, you I can mean, use. Eh, no, it, it, I mean, it, it works, but you have to have the elementary OS photo viewer and the elementary OS music application and the elementary OS this and the elementary OS that. And yep. to be honest with you, they're not a multi-million dollar company that can hire dozens and dozens of developers to work on each individual application. At best, they get a mild feature improvement after each release and uh, this is this is my issue here is when you reinvent these applications when you recreate them you, there is a massive technical debt that you undertake to make them as featureful as all of the other uh, applications that have been around for pot potentially 10 years but that's I, not what i mean i i i'm not saying that the elementary way is to to go i'm just saying that if i selected uh, that toolkit in the, those tools when i'm going there it's going to make my life easier there. And uh, because they select this path, it's going to be very clear that if I do GDKR, we'll get a few things for free, such as the widgets. When they change, it will change in my application as well. Same way that you do in Mac OS X with Cocoa. Um, but I really don't think this is a problem just because, I mean, developers have been using their toolkits. And when the toolkit is not there, some of them will actually compile the toolkit there. Yeah. Uh, 
I think the best is to the developers to focus on getting a good experience on their application, regardless of the toolkit, and then worry about, okay, can I port? Unless it's like a mobile platform where the constraint, like resources are constrained, and then you have to deal with just one toolkit. I guess right? I just look at, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm looking at the successful, like really successful uh, Linux-based platforms, and two that come to mind are Android, and Chrome OS, and both of those involve a limited set of choices for developers. Both of those involve a very narrow scope of what you can and cannot do, and how you do those things, and then where you publish those things. They all have a very set of strict lanes and you have to drive down and rules you have to follow, and, and the desktop is nothing, nothing like that. It is, the, it is a wild west and a cornucopia of choice, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Now, that said, I mean, I don't want to be all Mr. Anti-Forking and whatnot because Jake Edge over at LWN.net had a good piece um, about Linux and the Internet of Things. Um, he was talking about Tim Bird, who was giving a keynote at the Embedded Linux Conference. Um, uh, and this, he was, this piece was in, uh, at the end of April of this year. And he, he brought up a point that Linus made about forking the kernel. Uh, but Linus is actually, this was in an Ask Linus column from years ago when somebody asked Linus, said, do you... Do you get all upset when people fork the kernel and sort of start reinventing the wheel? And uh, Linus says, actually, he thinks that when folks targeting a new market where Linux does not have a presence, it actually makes a lot of sense to fork. Uh, he says, just as a new market, and we need a new base camp to attack from it. So when they fork, they're essentially creating a new base camp in that new market. And, you know, you look at how Android started. Android was originally a fork, and then later they've been folding much of the Android changes back into the mainline Linux kernel after years. Um, and so uh, he says, and Linus, I have to agree with, he says, you know, the key to getting in there is to have some place to start from. And sometimes fragmentation at the beginning looks like the end of the world, or it looks like it's going to be a huge mess. But because the code is open and the changes can be readopted if those upstream want them, it sometimes actually works out for the better. And, you know, in this case... Uh, the Linux kernel has gotten a lot better because of these kinds of forkings. Um, and I think that's telling, because if you can do it at the kernel level, you can certainly do it at the file manager level, or you can... I mean, nobody... Who, who says somebody doesn't take the new Qt file manager for Ubuntu, and it becomes, three, four years down the road, it becomes the default KDE file manager. They fork it, and they make a new Dolphin based around it, or something like that. I mean, you just never know what could happen. So maybe it won't well, be that bad. To, well, you have to bait the hook to suit the fish, right? I mean, that's what <laughs> he was saying. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Chris, uh, yeah, I think the market will just eventually sort it out, just like it's always done. Like the Linux community is pretty resilient when it comes to that stuff. So like eventually, it might not happen right away, but over time things will get sorted out. So right. Well, the with, client, as far as the client side decorations, those just need to go and burn in a pit somewhere. <laughs> so. Oh, I wow, mean, that's a little extreme. Yeah, <laughs> split quickly. Uh, uh, well, with my, with my app, we're actually what we're doing is separating the UI and the core. Mm -hmm. So the core is uh, being written completely without a UI, and then we can put an, any UI on top of it. So it could be Qt, it could be GTK, or whatever. And the reason we're doing this is because it allows us to make one core that can support mobile and desktop. So we uh, we're working on an Android version, and that particular that core will work also on the desktop with whatever toolkit we pick yeah that's the uh that's what the kde guys were doing i saw this uh video uh os something uh os connect uh where they this is kde's vision as far as i understand it uh you the basic toolkit has to be the same kde libs hasn't been upgraded from 4.9 because they're kind of uh halting it uh, the UI, they believe, has to be different for tablets, different for phones, and different for desktops. And this is exactly what is going on. You know, fragmentation is good if it's done properly. We have to, you know, bait the hook to suit the fish. Yeah. A phone UI is different, and it needs a different uh, ground. Uh, it needs a different implementation from the ground up, from the kernel to the uh, GUI toolkit to the actual interface. Right. The same with the desktop. Right. So, you know, I think that's what we're ignoring here. That. Um, we can't have the same UI across the board. And we have to both embrace the fragmentation and find a way to connect the dots, basically. Connect yeah. the different, uh, yeah. I also think, uh, you know, you, earlier the inter-app communication was brought up. I, I think the, the difference this time uh, with, with this type of future we're going into is 
uh, actual, reliable, and performant backend processing is literally today's reality. You know, you could throw something up on on a DigitalOcean Droplet, on a Rackspace machine, on Windows Azure, and you can have mm. essentially as much processing power as you need. So if you need to have different applications across a phone and a desktop communicate, we have a solution for that now. Uh, you know, you look at all these, uh, the, the augmentation you can add to help smooth out the rough edges between these different form factors and different types of devices that need to communicate with each other are, are, is much more of a reality now. It doesn't have to be device to device anymore. There can be a middle processor that, that does that logic work, that that's, does the storing, does the state information, and that's going to be extremely powerful. And I, I, I think, I'm hopeful, that's going to help smooth some of this stuff out too. Uh, so uh, a back end. Yeah, exactly. Which we, we're seeing different iterations of that now. It's just going to be it's going to become more prevalent. Um, you know, imagine a Linux dis distribution that uh, maybe has instead of now, I don't know if people would like this, but instead of each individual installation going out and doing a package refresh and pulling down all the repo information, maybe that distribution just has a has a single server that just you when you do an update your your linux box just connects to that server and says hey what's the latest package okay thanks and it's like this they're doing the back end refreshing of all the repos they're doing the back end caching even when, with your own personal repos and they're just delivering you a single answer across all your devices it's a weird example but you could see how back end back end uh, processing could be applied at all different levels of these things. It, it, it could really change things up. And that's just something we can't really wrap our brains around right now because we're just starting to see the beginnings of that. And that's going to be a major game changer down the road. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, on well, that. yeah. Okay. Cloud computing isn't a buzzword anymore. It is a reality. Yeah. We just yeah, don't have to it call is. it that. Let's just not call yeah, it that. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a buzzword. <laughs> but yeah. you, can't, you can't describe yes, to me is. what it actually means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but computing. Um, there you go. I did it for you. All right. Let's just bring it down to the earth and make a, make a fog. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or how I describe it, it's anytime the system is opaque and you can't tell what's going on inside of it. Right. Anytime it's magic. Um, <laughs> before we go, I wanted to give a special uh, shout out to uh, Irrational Number in the Linux Action Show subreddit. He's been doing an Ubuntu challenge and he's really going at this. This is a really interesting journey he's taking. Uh, it came up uh, actually during an IRC conversation during uh, not uh, from Linux Unplugged a few weeks ago. So with 1404, he made the switch over as a longtime Arch user to using Ubuntu. He, he did a great post that outlined his goal. And then he's done a great write-up on his first week and what he ran into and what he, you know, what kind of struggles he had. And how he just posted uh, two hours ago, uh, week two, another really good post. It, uh, you know what? This is the kind of thing you start reading it. It's actually very interesting. And then uh, there's some good conversations that are starting up around these posts, too. So I will link to these in the show notes if you guys want to read these. Uh, I thought they were pretty interesting to follow. And then one last thing. I wanted to cover before we run was a question that came in today to our subreddit. It says, my children's school district, this is a gray wolf night, my children's school district is looking at testing various options for replacing XP. Well, probably a lot of people are. Right now, they mostly have one main CPU, three to four workstations per room. They're trying Chromebooks for teachers and Windows 8. Oh. I would like to provide them with another solution. The school district doesn't have a lot of money, so I'm hoping to get a solution to help teachers and students. I was hoping to reach out to see if anyone out there has ideas for a desktop window manager and programs. I like Sugar Idea, but I have a hard time with it, so I'm not ready to make that work. I was able to get IT department to try out OpenOffice, but I need more solid programs, especially for teachers. Thanks to anyone who has some suggestions. I will tell you what I've seen work. I don't know if you're going to like my answer. Linux Terminal Services Project, Google Docs. The thing about the Google Docs is, and this is what you can't get around, and you can make the same argument with OpenOffice, but then it requires like parents at home to install software on the computer. The thing about the Google Docs is they just need to have the web browser. And Google just launched uh, Google Classroom, where, where schools are going to be able to do assignments and integrate that with Google Docs, and students will be able to check in. And again, all you have to do is just have the browser, and Google just announced that they also will not be doing tracking or ad sales against educational accounts, so the creepy factor has been reduced too. I don't know, how, I don't know what that means exactly, but they're supposedly not going to be scanning the content of children's Google Drives and, not, and, and, and you know, won't be displaying ads against that. So that seems good. So that's one solution. Linux terminal servers work really well. As long as you have even semi-decent connectivity, it works even over Wi-Fi, one box, and then you just have a multitude of front-end clients, you will be amazed at how smooth it works. I don't know, Matt, do you have any other suggestions for a cheap way to get I've, boxes in a school? 
Boy, I think that's I think you really nailed it. I know here uh, local community college, um, Google Docs and uh, Moodle. You know, those yep, are like yep. the two. Yep. Um, yeah. They have great success with that, and it actually works really well. I feel a little dirty recommending Google Docs because it, it's not a open source, and b there is gonna always be some kind of tracking. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like uh, it. You just can't get past that. They don't even have to run Linux at home, right? They could be on Windows, right. they could be on Mac, and they could still work on those same school docs. Uh, that's a pretty compelling use case for for students and schools. So that's well, yeah. I mean, because my nephew uh, uses a Windows machine at the school, then comes home, and we only use Linux here. So he has a Linux uh, Linux laptop in the uh, in his room, and he just logs into that, and nice. it doesn't care; it just works. Yeah, and so. uh, a chat room is bringing it up too. Edubuntu is a great distro mm -hmm. to run. Sure. In the, you could uh, we've also I've also done it with Fedora. There are specific spins of distros that are targeted for uh, Linux terminal services. So try it out, and uh, Edubuntu is a great start because it's really it's you know it's really focused at the educational market. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Well, guess what? That brings us to the end of this week's Linux Unplug. How about that? Did All you right. know? Hey, were you aware, Matt? This brand brand new. We just launched this. Did you know you could watch the show live? How about that? You can. I, mean, <laughs> I know it took a, it took a little working, but I found this company called Scale Engine. And they hooked us up. Yeah. So here you could. Right. Hey. Maybe you guys didn't know it. So come over at jblive.tv. We start at 2 p.m. Pacific or go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get in your like local time zone. Oh, oh, and go over to teespring.com slash CR100 for the Coda Radio 100 shirt. All right, Matt, I'll see you on Sunday, okay? See you Sunday. All right, everyone, have a great week. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday.